everybody, and welcome to our live Q&A session. I'm excited to be here with a panel of uh, mostly distinguished uh, developers <laughs> who are going to be here to take all your questions. So really think of this as an Ask Me Anything type of session. If you look there on your screen, you'll see the video with all of our pretty faces, and next to it you'll see the uh, box there with the chat. Please be sure you're clicking on the session chat and start putting your questions in now. we got uh, 30 or 40 minutes here, we're going to go through them all. So again, my name is Jason Slocum. I work with our, uh, I'm a Director of Product Management with the iTwin platform. And let me uh, ask the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Josh, you want to kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so I'm Josh Schiffner. I'm a Senior Development Manager at Bentley, uh, working on iTwin platform. I work in the Developer Success Group. So we're here to help you with, uh, help you with using the iTwin platform. So happy to answer questions today. Great. Matt? Hi, I'm uh, Matt Gooding. I'm a uh, software engineer on the uh, i2M platform team. Um, I am focused on um, game engines and uh, making the i2M platform easy to use with them. Thanks, Matt. David? Hey, everyone. Yeah, I'm David Jones. I, uh, I'm a development manager here. Uh, I run a couple teams that uh, develop software APIs for i2M platform, particularly the i2Ns and Access Control API. Okay, Bill, you're up. Thanks. My name is Bill Gehrig. I'm a software engineer here uh, in iTwin platform focused on iTwin JS and our uh, core iModel technology. Okay, last but not least, Pavan. Hello, everyone. I'm Pavan Imani. I manage the iTwin platform software development team, and uh, we're looking forward to answering all of your questions today. All right, well, thank you all. And uh, again, we encourage you all, please so do put your questions into the session chat. Um, I'm going to start by taking a few questions that came in during the technical sessions earlier today. Uh, the first one for the team here. Uh, so we talk about iModels, we talk about iTwins, um, but there's uh, some questions as to what's the difference? What's the difference between an iModel and an iTwin? Um, maybe, David, you can kick us off with that. Yeah, I'll take this one off the top. Yeah, so as the, the name of our platform suggests, uh, we have an, an entity called an iTwin. It's our digital twin entity. There's a lot of capabilities that an iTwin can, can provide. Uh, a few of those capabilities are having data uh, repositories associated to them, particularly for the purpose of representing your digital twin. You know, in fact, you can use our iTwin platform APIs to manage the lifecycle of an iTwin. You can manage the, the access control of your iTwin. You can use a suite of our platform APIs to associate data to your iTwin. In contrast, an iModel is one of those data repositories. It's typically used to represent engineering data, uh, but again, is associated to our digital digital twin and object. Okay. Anybody else want to expand on that at all? Or? Yeah, absolutely. What, what I'd like to add to what David just said is basically what we're providing with iTwin is a way to accumulate all the information you have today and over time in the future on the data you're going to collect about your asset and manage it. One of those important pieces of information that you manage is the, all the engineering information that you're managing with the various engineering applications that you have to create design data and to manage your asset and uh, upgrade your asset over time as well. So all of that information goes into an iModel, but it's associated with your iTwin for your asset so that you can apply it across the life cycle to essentially manage and maintain and uh, get insights on your asset. Okay, so if that's the difference between an iModel and an iTwin, maybe we could talk a little bit about, about what should really go into an iModel versus what shouldn't. Uh, Bill, anything you might want to... Yeah, so like David said, um, iModels are really built and designed for engineering data. That's data that comes from an engineering application or a particular, you know, engineering use case. Um, and so, uh, you know, a question we get asked a lot along those lines is, you know, how do I organize it into one iModel, many iModels, uh, you know, part of the connector process of getting that data into your iModel is really all about aligning that data. And so we don't uh, encourage you to have, say, one iModel per design file. Uh, we've designed iModels so that they could hold all of the engineering data for an entire project or asset. Um, but just like iTwins are a permissions boundary and something that you can add access controls around, uh, so too can you add iModel controls and access around that. So uh, the decision of when to break things into multiple I models really falls to uh, who owns that data, who should have access to that data, and what fits best with your workflow. It's really up to you and your users. Um, but uh, as in terms of performance and scale, you can fit 
everything into one I model if you want. Okay. Staying on the theme of I models, we have a question in the chat talking about running the connectors, which uh, we had some sessions on earlier today to bring the information into an I model. And the question we received here in the chat is that somebody's looking to bring some of their Revit, structural Revit models with our, their structural analysis models in, but saying when they run those uh, connectors, they're seeing errors at times, even though they're trying to clean up the Revit model as much as possible. And they're really looking for um, ideas as to what might be happening there. Are there things they can do to uh, try to, number one, under better understand those errors or, or avoid them altogether? Um, Bill, you want to Yeah, so, I mean, uh, connectors are solving a really difficult uh, problem for us, right? Uh, this data comes from a lot of different sources in a lot of different formats, even just the Revit file format. There's a lot of variety in what could be in one of those Revit files. Um, so there's, uh, you know, it's kind of to be expected things can go wrong in that process. Uh, there's a lot of uh, detailed feedback you can get from the connector jobs uh, that can help you kind of troubleshoot that and get to the bottom of what's happening. It's tough to say without knowing more of the details, um, but you can certainly uh, reach out to us and we can help you and through where, that. Where can people find that feedback? What, do we have tools available uh, for them to, yeah, maybe you were going to... I was, I was... You had the same <laughs> question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll add something to what yeah. Bill just said, right? So, as Bill said, this is complex information that we're trying to align with the biz schema. As we do that, when we notice these errors and warnings, we try to report them. Some of it you can see in our user interfaces, in our own Bentley's products, and uh, the UI elements we give out, but also the APIs for those connectors give out a vast error report, uh, usually in a JSON format. So you can take that as a developer and look at that information, see which of those errors and warnings are meaningful to you. Because sometimes we cannot decide what's important in your digital twin. Some of those errors might be actually noise that you don't care about as an as a asset digital twin user. So we're providing all that feedback back to you so that you can make those decisions. But we're also working on improving the fidelity of that data. So we're get, giving out better errors and warnings over time as well. So I don't want to lose the, I do want to keep this going, but don't want to lose the question Matt asked, you know, is there a good tool there that can help you to really understand some of those errors? I, th I think that I'm saying that right. Yeah, well, I actually think Pavan answered my, my okay. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was saying. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. All right. So um, another question, let's go a little bit more into what can kind of come in to formulate the entire iTwin. I have a question here. I, let's say I want to link elements in an iTwin with a URL to another platform. So for example, I want a simple link to a PDF for equipment. What's the best way for this URL data to be stored in Bentley's cloud on the iTwin platform? And then are there existing parts of the platform to do versioning on this type of data? So again, really linking out to other things like PDFs. Um, anybody, any volunteers for this one? I see Pop in your show. Oh, I'm sorry, David. You, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah. Well, so uh, one of our, our, our key um, offerings with our iTwin platform APIs is the, uh, the Entities Service API. It, it allows for you to describe your digital twin, uh, the entities of business significance within your digital twin, um, and provide external links to other engineering data, whether that be elements within an I model, external um, repositories of data, to the specific elements of, of significance within your digital twin. Uh, pr presuming uh, what, what the, the question was focused on is an is in, uh, entity within, within the I twin itself, you could associate a PDF to that, to that entity. In terms of how you do that, our open source iTwin JS plays a critical role. So whenever we assemble all of this engineering data into an I model within an iTwin, you can use our open source iTwin JS to interrogate the iTwin, run reports, look at element properties, but you can also use it to augment data to that element. You're essentially putting the link to that PDF. Uh, using iTwin.js and the library there and the APIs that are offered. I encourage all of you to visit the website and uh, look at those APIs. Yeah, so what I'm really hearing you say is there's, there's more than one way to slice this one, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it comes down to what's, you know, what, what's the magnitude of how you want to do this? Yeah. What, where do you want to persist that data? You know, do I want to create something in the iMod itself to really link that out? Do I want to use the, something like the entity service, which will be forthcoming here, I think, in the next uh, quarter, if I'm not mistaken, uh, such that you can kind of create those digital breadcrumbs out. So lots of ways to do it. Actually, if I could add one thing. Yeah. Um, there's the question of also how you surface that information. You have this link. 
you know, there's all kinds of different APIs in the viewer. Um, you can augment the properties so that when you're looking at the, the elements property in the grid there, you could see the link. You could customize a tooltip to show a link. So there's lots of different ways you can do that also. Excellent. J Josh, do you think we have a sandbox sample for that? Yes. In fact, I wrote a sample for <laughs> both of those. Uh, and yeah, the, both the, uh, the customizing the properties and also the, uh, the tooltips. Yeah. yeah, I find those sandboxes very useful. Yeah. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to uh, quote this question because I, I just love the wording. Let's say a knucklehead on a project posts a garbage file. Hey, uh, we, we all know some knuckleheads, talking right? Talking about me? <laughs> and, and, and so that, you know, somebody comes in, puts something in, posts with connectors, runs a, a connector job, posts something in there, it's, it's garbage. We really don't want it. And it gets integrated with the other good files in the named version. Is there a way I can retract that bad file? So uh, this is coming soon, the ability to sort of revert a particular change set. But that's the great thing about having change tracking and being able to manage the timeline of change is that, you know, that bad change is isolated at just one point on the timeline. And we can just undo that and take you back to a good state. And, of course, you have the, the other option, right. which is just to kind of unmap which will revert that. It'll still be in yeah. history, right. uh, yeah. you know, for a record for all time about right. the knucklehead's yeah. decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of have two ways to solve that. You can either add a new chain set that puts things back to rights, or if, if, coming soon, you'll be able to undo that chain set. Excellent. And then another question coming in through the chat is talking about um, archiving of iMiles. Somebody asks, um, how would iMiles be archived? Can they use Twin.js SDKs to create backups and restore? Or are there any other recommended ways to archive? Well, you can certainly use the uh, iTwin.js API to create snapshot iModels, which are uh, disconnected, standalone uh, versions of an iModel you can open up offline or uh, use in any of our tools. Um, those are a really nice option. Um, uh, if you're an uh, iTwin.js developer, they look just like a regular iModel uh, under the hood, so you can uh, I actually tend to use them when doing a, a quick and dirty development. Um, there are probably some other other uh, archive options uh, that my other panelists can uh, mention. I... Yeah, so, so overall, like uh, Matt said, you know, you can take a snapshot, save it away, uh, but we we primarily use that to for handover workflows mm -hmm. and things like that. You can use iTwin.js to read the data whichever way you want. You can export it to IFC if you want. We offer such a service as well. Uh, but as such, I want to reassure the, the developer that asked the question that we do make sure that all of your data is backed up uh, and it's stored securely. So we don't, we don't really think uh, you need to do this for your peace of mind. But if you have workflows where you need to take the data out to interoperate with uh, other systems, our i2nJS APIs come in, but we also provide the snapshot like uh, Matt said. Yep. And, and key to that snapshot is that, you know, you own that data. There's no lock-in. You can act. You can read and access that data without even using the platform at that right. point. Once you've exported it, and you could use it for maybe you have a third party who you're not quite ready to bring into your project yet, but you want to give them right. uh, a taste of your real data to work with. You know, you could give them that snapshot. You could even combine it with uh, our transformation services to filter out maybe some of the data you're not ready to share with them and uh, create a snapshot of that filtered. Uh, I don't know. So, so we talked a little bit then about, you know, you could do it some of that with i2n.js, you do some of that with the i2n platform, and it kind of opens up the question we hear a lot, hey, wh what is the difference between the i2n.js versus i2n platform? Um, Bill, maybe I'll, I'll ask you this to start in terms of giving us your take on, on how you describe the difference between the two. Yeah, so, uh, you know, i2n platform is our platform as a service. It's a collection of cloud services and uh, tools that you can use to build an uh, infrastructure digital twin. Um, iTwin.js, on the other hand, is a set of open source libraries. Some of what falls under iTwin.js are just client libraries to those platform services. Um, but a big chunk of what's in iTwin.js, sort of the core piece of that, is, uh, you know, the implementation of something as fundamental as, say, the iModel Access Service. You know, the code that we run when, you know, you call iModel Access Service is, you know, the bulk of that is part of iTwin.js. So it's all open source, the ability to read and write iModels. Um, and uh, so 
it's, it's kind of mixed. There's a lot going on in i2nJS. Um, and we certainly encourage you when using the platform to use i2nJS. That's definitely the easiest way to get started with a lot of the platform services. Um, but i2nJS is an entirely open source effort that, you know, we put out there. It's kind of, we want to get a lot of community involvement and, uh, and really drive that forward. The, the way that I like to think about it is that iTwin platform is like this big umbrella that's used to build solutions for your digital twin application. iTwinJS is a piece of that, a key piece of that, that is our open source aspect of our, of our platform that is, you know, the JavaScript tooling used to actually um, render, the, render the application. Right? Yeah. So would it be fair to say that iTwin platform is really using iTwinJS, we're running iTwinJS for you as a service, once again, platform as a service. Yeah. And the whole advantage there is, hey, yeah, you could take i2nJS, you could do all this yourself, you'd build all the orchestration, all the work flows yourself. We've been doing this for a few years. We recognize it's really easy to say, a bit more difficult to do. And, and so, um, you know, when I, when I speak to all of you, when I speak to others, uh, what I hear is, hey, yes, we love the idea that we have the flexibility of doing this, but we also recognize that that's not how we make our money, is <laughs> going through and doing that. And boy, if, if we have a platform that can do it for us, there's some, some benefits there. Is that, am I saying that right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, in terms of how we use i2nJS, it's a lot of us eating our own dog food, as they say. Um, you know, what we're putting out there in the open source is code that we rely on and trust in, you know, building a great platform. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have another way that we read I models. Yeah. You know, we're using the same thing that uh, we use every day to yeah. build all of our software. So we've been talking about iMiles, we've been talking about iTwins. Got a question here about reality data. Um, so a big part of what could be in a iTwin would be reality data. And this one in particular is talking about, uh, earlier today, saw that you could take 2D photos and convert those 2D photos into a 3D mesh or a reality model. Um, and the question here is, could you please explain what happens in the background for that conversion? So they're not looking for all the details, but just a, a general sense of, of what's happening as you go from the 2D photos into a, a 3D mesh. I'll be honest, I, I understand what the service does. <laughs> I, I, I'd be hard pressed to say technically what's happening behind the curtain. Do, do any of you guys? Uh... Uh, it's based on a paper uh, you could read and implement yourself. <laughs> uh, but our guys uh, yeah, uh, put a lot of work into uh, uh, handling all of the edge cases. Uh, I don't know, Pavan, would you want to add? <laughs> yeah, so, so essentially I'll, I'll, I'll get to the answer, but essentially you have engineering data for your asset, but many times what you don't have is, uh, how is it built? Is it exactly match my engineering data? So you're gonna either take a bunch of pictures or uh, do some LIDAR scanning and things like that. And when you have all of that, you need to bring it all together in one place. So what you do is you take all those pictures and you're running the algorithm, like Matt, you said, you're taking a paper, you apply the algorithm and we apply some custom machine learning techniques to it as well to identify features, but we're essentially using cloud scale GPUs in the cloud that automatically scales based on uh, how many photos you have, how big an area of, uh, that you're trying to cover with all these pictures. And we're trying to build that mesh, a very high fidelity mesh that you can then automatically align with your engineering model and see how it aligns. Is there issues? Do you need to update your design? Do you need to actually do some issue resolution, run some projects of actually fixing some interferences that you have, and things like that. So, so that's the intent of providing all this information in one place. But hopefully I did touch on the answer of what we do with those 2D pictures and how we give out the mesh at the end of the day. I, I just want to add, I, I think this is so cool. Uh, not only do we uh, uh, make these uh, meshes, but we, uh, our service also uh, does analysis so it can find cracks and defects. Right. I think we had exactly. a session talking about that earlier. Um, uh, we uh, can blur um, license plate numbers, uh, do all kinds of uh, really, you know, frankly, magic. <laughs> yeah. If I could interject, um, maybe a little plug for our blog. We have a, a blog on, on Medium, if you know it, for i2JS. And uh, our colleague Roop did a great article, and he built a reality mesh on his, using his coffee table. <laughs> this was during lockdown, right? So you can go out of the house. He, he arranged some, some plates and mugs and stuff, and he, he made uh, tape. Uh, coffee Table City, yeah. <laughs> using his iPhones. And, and I, I, I was so fascinated by this. I did it myself uh, with my house one time. I, I, you know, I had some sense I'd have to go out and buy high-end equipment to do this. And I was able to actually take my, my iPhone and go out and, and take some pictures, just walk around the house and 
do that. I assume that's kind of what Roop did probably as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Just took his iPhone, took some Just pictures. walk around the coffee table. He actually has a video showing you how to do it yourself, and uh, and then you get a nice mesh, and you can integrate it right into your uh, to your iTwin, yeah. Well, staying on the topic of reality modeling for a minute, uh, I have another question here. Any thoughts on enabling reality model viewer options within an ad hoc version of iTwin? I'm going to guess it, that I understand what that means, but maybe you guys have a different way of interpreting the question. My, my guess is that right now, my understanding, Josh, we've spoken about this a bit. If I want to go in and view reality data in the iTwin viewer, there's a prerequisite that I have to have an iModel in there. Even if the iModel doesn't have any data in it, there's still a kind of a gotcha there, if you will, of having an iModel in. I, I think, uh, I don't know what, if one of you guys can comment on that, but I think there's some work underway. There. That's coming very soon. Um, in fact, there's nothing under the hood that requires an iModel. It, you know, iTwin viewer is not an iModel viewer. It's meant to be a viewer for your whole digital twin. Um, so uh, that's kind of just a, an oversight we had that we required an iModel ID and everything in there. Uh, that'll be probably fixed in the, in the next major version of the, the viewer. Okay. Th that said, I did want to add that you ha it's not a blocker today. You can view yeah. reality yeah. data. In fact, the reality viewer that that uh, question references is based on the iTwin viewer itself. Yeah, I mean, w uh, what you do today in uh, iTwin JS is you just use a blank uh, iModel connection. Right. And so if, if you set that up, that's all you need to do to have an iTwin viewer without an iModel. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, guys. And so let's stay on the topic of iTwin. We spoke about some of the engineering design information coming in with connectors and the like. Talked about linking out with URLs to other information. Talked about reality data. Let's talk about sensors now, too. It's a topic I know. It's, uh, you know we, we talk about digital twins, and, and, and yes, a digital twin is meant to be kind of a representation of what's really happening in real time. Sensors are a huge part of that, right? Any, any, any thoughts relative to... Um, what it means to bring sensors into an iTwin? I know Josh. This uh, is a, a let topic. me take that. Yeah, <laughs> you run into quite a bit. Sure. So, um, so the way we integrate with uh, with what I call real real time data, or IoT data, sensor data, is the process we call federation. So, uh, what all the federation just means is we don't copy that data into your iTwin. We just uh, we just integrate with it. We overlay it with your um, your data from your i model or from your reality data. Um, We've done several pilot projects with my team with uh, different companies, um, including um, vend IoT vendors themselves, you know, how to integrate their data, and also uh, with engineering companies who are um, using, uh, you know, major IoT vendors like, like um, Azure IoT from Microsoft or AWS Core from Amazon, right? Um, so in all of these cases, what we've done is we, we federate the data in, we visualize it together, and we, we, we focused on both um, real-time data and also historical data, right? So all of those systems have a, a way of um, uh, what they call a, uh, a data historian uh, to track all that. And again, we, we overlay that um, through this federation process. Josh, I want to add something to that, right? So as we federate all of this, uh, I know you've written some blog articles and demos on this as well. Yeah. We're human beings. We need to see what's happening with that digital twin using that sensor information. What our viewer allows is uh, you can do animations, you can do color coding, you can do alerts, you know, you can pop up red if the temperature in the room, for example, is going up. Uh, you can even send warnings out if you integrate with enough APIs uh, to tell people what's happening or to tell systems what to do. So you can do all of those things from the viewer by integrating and federating all this information together as well. It's very cool what you can accomplish with these technologies today. And you, you said federating a few times there, Pom. Just just to make sure we're all on the same page. When you say federating, can you, you describe a little bit more what you mean by federating the data versus... Yeah, J Josh touched on it, right? So when we say iTwin, we really, what we mean is we don't need to make a copy of all of your data. What we're trying to do is align enough of that information, provide enough of those digital breadcrumbs to tie that information together. Sometimes we do make a copy to cache it to make your user experience better, but in this case, with IoT data, most of the time, those systems scale very well. So as long as we can talk to those APIs, and you know how to talk to those APIs, along with our APIs, you can put all of this together and make it look like magic to your end users and make their experience so much more better than what they can do with just dashboards today. 
of that information. And this goes to the question you asked earlier, I think uh, Bill answered about what belongs in an I model and what doesn't, yeah. right? I mean, engineering belongs in an I model, engineering data, but you know, the history of the temperature of a room for the last six months does not belong in an I model. Yeah. But there are data historians that will track that and, and maintain it for you if you want it. So, yeah. uh, we're going to run out of time here pretty fast. Time flies when you're having fun, so we keep us going. Um, so, we're getting a question about the samples. They're up on developer.bentley.com. Josh, I know your team's helped build them. All you guys have helped contribute towards those samples. The question is, are those samples ready to be integrated with my application directly, or is there something that has to be done first to update it? <laughs> so, well, yeah, so we, we actually just, um, uh, it's a couple months ago, but we, we have a feature, um, it's an export feature. You can take any of our samples, uh, click the export button, and it, it'll give you uh, all the files that you can put directly into, uh, you know, your editor of choice, into your development environment, and just build it and run it locally, just the way they are. You don't have to do a thing to them, they're, they're ready to go. Um, there's also a tutorial um, that shows how to take a sample uh, and just pull the right parts out of it. If you already have a big application, you don't want to start from scratch. You just want to bring that particular sample into it. We've got instructions for you for that too. And, and what about somebody who wants to go in and, and they're saying, hey, I'd love to try this, but I, I don't have engineering design files, for example. I don't have Revit files. I don't have uh, MicroStation files. W where can they get started? All right, I'll take that one also. Um, <laughs> this is my well. This is my favorite topic, actually. This all these samples and stuff, right? Um, so, right on developer.bentley.com, there's a there's a page there called My High Models. Uh, go there. Say you want to create a new one, and you got a few options. Uh, if you don't have anything, you can use one of our samples. We'll make it will we'll make a copy of the sample for you. Um, if you do have some DGN files, you can. You could just drag and drop them, and they'll, you know, we'll run through our connectors and, and bring them in. So I think those are your two really good options. And not just DGN files. Uh, That's right. And yeah. any kind of file you find on the internet. There are a lot of 3D files out there. <laughs> go right. to Sketchfab. Go, go anywhere. Yeah. Throw them in. It'll work. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a page up there, too, and I never remember how to find it, that lists all 40-plus formats yeah. that we support. Yep, it's underneath the connectors. If you go there and look at synchronization up for the uh, APIs, and look at the reference documentation, there's a page right in there that tells you all the formats, if I remember right. Yeah. So, um, so we, we talked a bit before about i2NJS and, and how we're using that with the i2N platform. But one other thing that I think uh, folks don't always appreciate is as we, we're out there and uh, giving developers the opportunity to work with the i2N platform and to uh, kind of accelerate some of their development, we kind of eat our own dog food here, right? We have other Bentley teams that are building with the i2N platform. But the question that, that was raised in one of the sessions er, earlier today is, let's say an i has got somebody's gone and created an i in, in one of the Bentley applications that's off the shelf, so you know, something like maybe our, our Synchro application for construction management. Could they use that Synchro i or that i I should say, that was created in Synchro within the application that the, uh, some other developers building? Uh, I see everybody looking at Dave and Dave. Dave, 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 Dave. Yeah. So, look, there's, there's nothing special about an iTwin that makes it special that it was created in Synchro or created in any, any other powered by iTwin application. Everything is controlled by our access control API. That's how you manage the members that have access to your iTwin and the permissions that those members have to your iTwin. Uh, similarly, um, you can create a service uh, application and you can provide access that service application to your, to your digital twin. And then, uh, you know, once you set up your authorization model appropriately, you can access that iTwin in, in any powered by iTwin application. Yeah, to, to add to that, right, an iTwin itself represents a digital replica of your physical asset. And uh, it's just that each application does something very specific with that iTwin, but the iTwin itself is meant to work with many applications that are essentially built, built on top of the iTwin platform and powered by iTwin. So it is by design that we allow an iTwin to work with many applications and to leverage that digital twin that uh, you as users are investing in. Yeah. In particular, uh, your, your Synchro files, those are just iModels under the hood. Uh, and uh, that this is actually how we built our integration with LuminRT, with Omniverse, uh, our Unreal Datasmith exporter. We just use the uh, iModelJS, the iTwinJS uh, myself, uh, I do NJS uh, APIs uh, to pull out the uh, schedule animation and uh, 
put it into a format that those understand. Right. Um, we're doing the same thing that you're doing. But those same, of course, the, you're looking at the schedule information there, but you could have an app that doesn't care about the schedule information. Sure, yeah. And yeah, absolutely. it can use that same data, you know, the, the same underlying model there. And that's what's so important about biz and aligning the data in an I model is when you have a common understanding of the data, you don't need to be really close to the original domain that created that data. You can still have some, you know, base level understanding of that and, you know, do useful things with that information. Uh, even if you didn't understand the original domain. Yeah, and then I, I think we saw a couple of good sessions earlier today on that, both uh, the one that Colin did with us, talking about biz and giving a better understanding of what that all means, as well as the one, uh, I forget who did it on, on reporting, uh, was, was that Arnab? Arnab. Arnab yeah, 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 did the reporting one, yeah. Mapping, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Arnab. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but showing you then how to, you know, some different ways instead of having to go in and build your own queries there and, and uh, look at it, because it really is, if I'm not mistaken, just a SQL database underneath the curtain, right? That so we could run and run SQL like yeah, SQL Lite with some there. really uh, special secret <laughs> sauce there. <laughs> but then with this, uh, with some of the reporting services we have, simplifying how you can yeah. really read that information, extract it, gain value. Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, everybody's favorite topic. Um, so in in the keynote this morning, um, I think it was a uh, Kostov spoke about extensions, and um, was. We have a question here. Can extend? Uh, I'm gonna try to paraphrase. Uh, can extensions be used to create add-ons to existing Bentley iTwin JS based viewer products? Is the way the word came in here. Um, so you know, in other words, can I create? I'm gonna paraphrase. My understanding is, can I go in and create an extension that can run inside uh, other applications using the iTwin viewer? So the short answer is that depends on the product that you're trying to extend. Um, ultimately, you know, it's. The decision of an iTwin powered application, uh, how they want to allow extensibility and everything. What we've done with uh, extensions in iTwin JS is really build a, a you know, solid foundation for enabling applications to uh, let you do that kind of extensibility. Um, so I can't make any promises as to what will or won't support you know, uh, extending functionality. Um, but what we've done with extensions is really give you a way to uh, jump right to the functionality you want to add. Uh, you know, the iTwin viewer is a perfect example. I can skip right to what do I want to show in the viewer? Do I want to, uh, you know, layer in this federated data in the view? Do I want to uh, play some animations or do coloring or any of that, you know, uh, graphical additions? Um, Skip right to that functionality and then also encapsulate that functionality so that it's more easily shared um, between applications. To, to add to that, Bill, so our, our primary intent of introducing iTwin Viewer and those viewer extensions to go with it is that people are able to create those viewer extensions and then reuse them with any application that's using the iTwin Viewer. Uh, we have many powered by iTwin applications that are all adopting this technology that are their uh, feature set and when the rollout is different. That's why I understand we can't make those promises, but our intent is that, and we have people working towards that. We have third parties building some of those extensions and are interested. So the goal is to make it more ubiquitous so that uh, it's just not Bentley building those extensions. Anybody can build them and anybody can use them with other applications. Yeah. So I, yeah. I know we always need to be a little careful when we have these fun uh, interactive sessions <laughs> about future facing statements, right? Yeah. Um, but, but we did a follow-up here about, so is there, is there kind of an idea where you might be able to run one of those extensions in design review, one of the Bentley applications, for example. I, I know that's when we, we might need to be a little careful about how we respond to, as a public trade company, we, we, we got to be careful yeah, about. We, you should open. follow up with the design yeah. review team and get back to them. That's, yeah. that's yeah. probably the best way to leave it yeah. there, so <laughs> yeah. we'll park that for the moment, but uh, we will reach out off, offline there. Um, and, and Cambly, with any of those things, you know, I'm going to put my product management head on for a moment. If you have interest in those types of things where you're saying, hey, I'd really love to be able to do this, like I'd really love to be able to build an extension that can run inside of another Bentley application, love to hear from you. Please do reach out to us. If you go on the developer portal underneath support, there's a, a place to actually post your ideas. Please keep them coming. We'd love that type of feedback. Helps shape, we know what we're doing the right things for, for all of you. All right, let me see what else we have here. Um, one moment. Well, and you know, back to the previous question too. I mean, extensions aren't the only way to tap into yeah. to your iTwin, tap into the data that is exposed within an application like Design Review. 
there's nothing that stops you from creating your own application that taps into that same iTwin and, and you know, performs the workflows that you're intending to, to perform within an extension. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That's actually one of the things that excites me most about iTwin Platform and uh, iTwin.js. It's really easy to uh, cook together, you know, a five-line uh, TypeScript program that uh, solves some particular purpose, runs very quickly, you know, and get on with your day. Yeah, right. You get, you know, by leveraging the iTwin created in, say, Design Review, you get to skip right to what do I do with that data versus how do I get all the data in and, um, you know, yeah. You get to leverage all of that right away. Yeah, this is, what we're helping by creating that iTwin is uh, providing ways for you to turn that data into information that you can use and act on. Yeah. Now, now one question that we do hear from time to time is, all right, so I'm interested, right? I, I want to go out and build something. You guys give me a bunch of different ways I can kind of approach building. What happens if I do build that and then I want to take something out to market? Do I retain all that intellectual property of, of what I built? Or does Bentley get some of that and, and you know, if Bentley's building their own applications, what's that mean for us? Um, Pavan, I know you, you and I have spoken yeah. about this before. Yeah, I, I, look, I mean, frankly, we're providing API, so what you bill <laughs> is your application, you own it. Uh, we hope you make money in the market, find a lot of users, and uh, those users benefit from uh, using that iTwin and your application. Our goal is to give you as much functionality as possible so that you can help your users be successful do whatever they're doing, right? You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to become productive and our goal is to help you take your application to market as quickly as possible. You own the application we built. Yeah. So, so the and short answer to that is absolutely you retain all your intellectual property. Yes. And, that's, and that's I, would, short I would add to that with iTwin.js, we've purposely chosen very permissive licensing there. Yeah. So uh, it's not copy left. Anything you use from iTwin.js, you're free to ship in proprietary commercial products as well. Um, you know, we currently use uh, MIT. We're looking to switch to Apache to be even more permissive. And what if somebody wants to get involved in, in the community there more so with iTwin.js? Is there ways that they, someone can go about getting a little bit more involved to actually participate in, in kind of helping shape what we're doing there since it is a, an open source project? Yeah, there's loads of ways to get involved. Uh, my favorite is uh, check us out on GitHub. We're right there uh, uh, in the iTwin GitHub org. iTwin.js core is our kind of, you know, first place to start. Um, there's issues there that are tagged good first issue. We're always looking for PRs that are, you know, extremely appreciated. Um, even if it's not a big change, you know, if you notice a typo in the docs, a PR is a great way to uh, get started contributing. Um, we're always open to that. Uh, in terms of just connecting with us and reaching out, GitHub Discussions is a good way to do that. If you have issues, obviously GitHub Issues is a good way to open those. Um, there's loads of ways to get started. Uh, and join the open source community we've got. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. I'll plug uh, Josh's uh, favorite thing. Uh, you can also uh, contribute your own uh, sandboxes to show other users how to get things done, show off your skills, uh, and uh, find or, clients. Or, or your issues, right? Um, sure, yeah, yeah. They'll yeah. say, hey, uh, <laughs> this thing doesn't That's work. Well, <laughs> yeah. here's a sandbox that shows why it doesn't work, you know, and then hopefully, you know, we'll get fixed real yeah. quick for you. All right, well, guys, I'm, I'm being given kind of the, uh, the, the two-minute warning here, so I guess we've got to start winding this down here. Uh, I'll just go down the line. Any, any parting thoughts from, from uh, maybe starting with Pop and just uh, things that you might want to leave the group with here? Yeah, no, uh, so uh, we are looking forward to all the applications you'll build, right? You know, we're looking forward to everybody going on their digital journey, helping uh, these users in the infrastructure market taking this information and doing something productive with it, right? And as uh, Jason pointed out earlier, we love your suggestions, ideas, uh, that it helps us steer in the direction we're going. So please uh, contact us and let us know what you want, uh, what you think, and uh, how are these things being useful to you? Right. Yeah. When I say final thoughts, I'm going to keep them a little smaller here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, right down the lane. Uh, I'll just plug uh, our ability to track changes with iModels. It's really important. If you've missed it, check out Diego's presentation on changed elements. API, it's really cool. Awesome. David? Well, well, I'll just say we're excited about iTwin Platform. If you've got any questions, concerns, whatever, please reach out, GitHub. Uh, yeah, we'll be happy to talk to you. Cool. Matt? If you missed it, watch Bill's session from this morning, Bill and Rube's session from this morning. <laughs> it's a great overview of uh, how to get started. Uh, the best I've seen that we have. Unless you get motion sickness, in which case, close your eyes about <laughs> halfway through, because there's a little spin, spin there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Josh. Developer.bentley.com, right at the top, samples. Lots of interesting stuff in there. Check it out. All right. 
And, and I'll just close out by, hopefully you, you heard the passion here. These guys are excited about what they're doing. They want to help you. We all do. So please do reach out. But uh, we are out of time here. One thing I, I want to highlight, um, you might see up there on the screen, there's something called Lounge. While we're going to be closing out now, um, the lounge is going to be open for another 30 minutes. We'll be there interacting. So if we missed your question, apologies. Um, but, but please join us in the lounge. We'll keep the conversation going. Uh, we all, we've gotten a few questions throughout the day. Will these uh, sessions be recorded and available afterwards? Yes. Click here at the same link. Come back uh, in about two hours, so I think 5.30 Eastern, I was told. They, all the sessions should be available here on demand. You can navigate around, see what you want. And then I think uh, we'll have them up on YouTube, I'm told, uh, sometime towards the end of the day tomorrow. And uh, with that said, we're out of time. Thank you all for joining us for this live Q&A. Look forward to doing the next one. Thank you all, panelists, for participating. And I'm going to kick us over now to Pavan Amani to uh, close us out. Have a great day, everybody. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in today's iTwin Developer Conference, including Omkar and Srikant, for their participation in our keynote and all the presenters in our technical breakout sessions. I also want to thank our conference sponsors, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Siemens, and iTwin Ventures, along with all the iTwin platform partners who helped make this a great event. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check out the exhibit hall to learn more about our sponsors and partners. And most importantly, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to join us for today's iTwin Platform Developer Conference. I know you're excited to apply what you've seen today. A great place to start is our developer portal at developer.bentley.com, where you can find samples, reference documentation, training, and support. I also suggest you review the related content tab below the video player. This tab includes links to several recommended next steps, including a link to sign up for a 90-day free trial of the iQuin platform and the limited time offer to sign up for a complimentary session with our developer success team who can assist you with reviewing your ideas and provide recommendations to help you accelerate your work. If you missed a session or want to watch them again, you can access the recordings by coming back into the event interface where you'll see a list of the recorded sessions and other conference materials. The sessions will also be available on the iTwin YouTube channel. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for helping make this a great event. We look forward to supporting you in advancing the world's infrastructure sustainably. Thank you, everyone.